This is the Breaker.News podcast for the week of December 19th, 2021. I'm Bob Mackin, publisher of the Breaker.News and host of the Breaker.News podcast. Welcome to edition number 217. The Breaker is your source for news, opinion, and analysis about British Columbia issues, institutions, and influencers. Later, I'll tell you how you can support The Breaker. On this edition, headlines from the Pacific Rim and the Pacific Northwest. The Is It Just Me commentary. I award a virtual Nanaimo bar to a difference maker. And the Big Deal feature. Do Justin Trudeau, John Horgan, Kennedy Stewart, and Doug McCallum deserve a candy cane or a lump of coal for Christmas? will rate their performance in 2021 with guests Mike Klassen and Cash Heed. But first, is it just me? Is it just me, or is it time once again to gather around the Christmas tree, grab a cup of eggnog, put a log in the fireplace? Well, here it goes, with apologies to Clement Clerk Moore. Twas the podcast before Christmas and all through B.C. Not a creature was stirring, not even a flea. Public health orders flying through the air. Issued so late, does the NDP not care? Others warned how fast Omicron spreads. Surely we'll run out of hospital beds. But dicks in the dock and their weekly pap caused experts to yell, do more, cut the crap. No more lockdowns, they natter. Too much booze makes B.C. get fatter. NDP is hiding the rapid test kits, the booster shots so slow it's the pits. Mixed messages, confusion, cart before the horse, almost two years of par for the course. Somewhere a tunnel, at the end there is light. Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. It's been a tough year in BC, the pandemic, the overdose crisis, the heat dome, the floods. My Christmas wish to you happiness and health and peace on earth. What do you think? Email bob at thebreaker.news. This is the Big Deal feature on the Breaker.News podcast. It was supposed to be the year that we ended the pandemic. More people in British Columbia got vaccinated against the coronavirus in 2021 than voted in the 2017 and 2020 provincial elections combined. But we end the year with Omicron spreading around, and we wonder when the pandemic will end. In 2021, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau tried to be like BC Premier John Horgan, but the Liberals got another minority in a $600 million unnecessary election. Horgan faced protesters who wanted to save the Ferry Creek Forest and stop the coastal gasoline pipeline. His government didn't do enough to warn the public about the heat dome in late June and the torrential rains that caused floods in mid-November. Nearly 600 people died in the former. In the latter, billions of dollars of damage to farmland in Abbotsford, as well as Merritt, Princeton, and the Coquihalla Highway. Surrey Mayor Doug McCallum pushed ahead with his startup police force and said he got run over in a mall parking lot in September. Vancouver Mayor Kennedy Stewart, he said he got threatened in a Yaletown wine store. The only charge that happened was against McCallum for public mischief. Police believe that he lied about the incident. So who deserves a candy cane? Who deserves a lump of coal? Joining me to rate Trudeau, Horgan, McCallum, and Stewart are my guests, Vancouver Overcast podcaster Mike Klassen and former BC Solicitor General Cash Heed. Does Justin Trudeau deserve a candy cane or a lump of coal? We'll start off with you, Mike Klassen. I think uh, the Prime Minister is probably going to get a box of turtle chocolates. Uh, he, um, uh, it, At the end of the day, he, the, he still wields an enormous amount of power in this uh, this country. Uh, he won the election, whether you're a minority or majority, he rolled the dice and evidently he won. Uh, they just released the mandate letters this week. We sort of see the new government uh, in place. No sense that the opposition is really pressing for any a great change right now. Aaron O'Toole is, uh, has his own headwinds with his own leadership. Uh, it's unlikely we're going to see any big changes. I think uh, the story that you mentioned, the Tofino story, was probably the biggest uh, dent in the armor of the prime minister that we've seen in a little while. It was obviously and clearly a mistake for him to have 
have done what he did at that time. But, um, you know, here we are sort of almost a couple of months later and people are not talking about that story anymore. I'm sure that there are probably some hard feelings, especially among the First Nations communities. Um, but uh, I'm sort of looking forward into the future with uh, with the Prime Minister and I think uh, and, 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 and his government. And uh, they've got significant challenges ahead of them right now. I mean, the, um, obviously some really large concerns about public spending, uh, the rising rate of inflation that uh, uh, the Conservatives have been beating the drum about. And uh, how do we uh, uh, pull our way out uh, ahead uh, with uh, the uh, the current uh, sort of financial situation with regards to the pandemic? Uh, it's I guess it's somewhat heartening to see that the uh, uh, the Coquihalla Highway will probably be opening soon, uh, meaning that um, access to ports and and the delivery of goods, which is so critical to our economy, will uh, uh, be reopened in the new year, and uh, and hopefully uh, the the economy will rebound as a result of some of that. But uh, I still think that that is the the missing piece right now that I'm seeing from the Trudeau government, which is a real clear focus on where he wants the economy to go, because there are a lot of people right now that are uh, going to be uh, uh, really struggling with uh, higher cost of living and um, and potentially um, uh, just not being able to goods that they need to kind of run their businesses and, and, and their households. And Cash, uh, 2021 federally was a lot like 2020. The biggest foreign policy challenge remains to be China. The two Michaels are now home, uh, but uh, Trudeau has not made the decision on Huawei. Meanwhile, there is a new US, UK, Australia alliance that doesn't include Canada. But does uh, does Trudeau deserve a candy cane or a lump of coal in your mind? I think he deserves a candy cane. And the other, for more reasons uh, than one could imagine, uh, simply because uh, he is actually being very diplomatic in what he is doing. Uh, I think some people criticize him based on calling the election, but those are people that uh, will criticize Trudeau for anything and everything. I think he's done a relatively good job this year. Of course, we were disappointed we went to an election in the middle of a pandemic, but it's all forgotten and we're on our way. I like the idea of a minority government. I think it gives more of a balanced approach to what we need during the crisis that we're going through right now. On foreign policy, he's made some changes in his ministers that are actually running that part of it, or at least trying to run that part of it without any interference from other people on that. I think he situated Canada rightly so in how we approach these particular problems. I think he's really alienated a lot of the other side of the house, such as the conservative side of the house, because of the uh, hard-lined, aggressive approach they were expecting and wanting Canada to take to deal with some of these uh, large foreign issues. So I think he deserves a uh, candy cane. I'm looking forward to the diplomacy that he brings to the table and his ministers bring to the table when dealing with China, when dealing with the United States, when dealing with France and everyone else that we have to uh, have some balance with. There's also now questions about uh, John Horgan and his health in 2021 going to 2022 uh he insists he'll be back he insists uh, he'll get through the uh the chemotherapy treatments uh however there's going to be a new sheriff in town on the other side of the aisle the uh, bc liberals are electing a new leader in february could it be possible that we'll have uh two new leaders instead of just one by this time next year do you think john horgan is in it for the long haul uh, or is he satisfied with winning the election last year? And does he have what it takes to get through another year as difficult as 2021, if 2022 is as difficult as 2021? First of all, I think John Horgan is going to get a candy cane because the fact is, um, at the end of the day, he's still one of the most popular premiers in the country. And you, you, whether you are critical of, of uh, his government or not, the fact is that um, he has uh, shown himself to be fairly resilient. Uh, there are a few things that um, that sort of stand out for me. One uh, on the uh, so-called uh, kind of green flank of of the NDP support, it's always been a wild card for that party. I mean, it, fundamentally, at the end of the day, the BC NDP have been built around the the the, the labor movement, and so the the green um, uh, environmental movement is something that is sometimes a little bit on the outside, and certainly when they get their uh, teeth into issues like Ferry Creek, like Wet'suwet'en, they're not 
going to uh, let go of that just because of any kind of political allegiance that they would have to a few select members of that party. Um, th there's something about John Horgan's leadership that I think really has stood out, and it feels like he's been running the province more as an executive premier. And I'm not sure if that's just as a result of the pandemic, but he has kept his head down even prior to the announcement of his health um, concerns later in the year. Um, I think that if I'm going to be critical of, of this government, it is in terms of the emergency response. I felt that they were uh, uh, off the mark, uh, slow on the BC flood situation. And I'm, we're talking uh, maybe a day or two or three, and certainly some things that could have been done better. Um, but uh, I thought that the heat dome one was one that um, left me feeling very disappointed. I, I uh, worked with an organization. We issued our own announcement around making sure that seniors were taken care of um, and, uh, and did that you know, a couple of days in advance of that incredible weather event. So um, there's lessons to be learned on the, on the public safety and, and, and emergency response side. I think all governments might struggle with that, but there's a lot of uh, already good uh, research and science uh, and, and protocols that are in place. They just need to open those manuals, get at it. Uh, and unfortunately, they didn't do that. Um, but uh, I do think now the, the real question now uh, that you're asking is about the future of, of John Horgan himself. Um, these things are very, very difficult. They're difficult for not only the leaders themselves, the people around them, but their family members. And I don't think anybody wants to see John Horgan having to sacrifice you know, his quality of life just for the sake of sitting in the premier's chair. I do think that um, uh, the 2024 time period looks very long, especially if you're dealing with something as serious as, as, a, as a cancer treatment. But uh, that's not to say there are not already people uh, talking about prospective leaders out there. Uh, we can get into the names a little bit later, but the fact is uh, there always is going to be somebody who's wanted to succeed John Horgan. Uh, he may be the guy that you want to have a beer with, but the fact is um, he's, um, uh, you know, he's probably prepared to move on at some point. I don't see him running again. And I do see some other people in the party stepping up to try and take his job. Cash, he lump of coal or candy cane for John Horton? Uh, John, I'd like to give him a bag of candy canes. And, uh, you know, I really feel for this guy. I think he's done a great job uh, trying to uh, move BC to more of a, a better standing than we had previously. Uh, I think his second term hasn't been success as successful as his first term. And I think, you know, again, I'm a proponent of uh, minority governments and having that balance in place. I'm not a proponent of majority governments that come in and do whatever they want, whatever way they want. I think we don't get the balance that's needed. So in his first term as premier, I think he did a great job maintaining uh, the balance with the coalitions, quasi coalition that he put together. But I think the second term, he's had no opposition. And, uh, you know, with the Liberals, uh, I think they've uh, still uh, are dealing with the implosion that they've had. Uh, I know the heir apparent is Kevin Falcon going forward, and uh, I think we'll uh, realize that soon. Uh, can he move the Liberals up to be a, a forthright opposition to the NDP? I'm not sure right now. So the NDP, although this term have not done a, a outstanding job and, and Mike certainly identified a couple of the critical issues that they failed upon that are directly affecting the constituents here in BC. I think the fact that uh, they've had nobody that was clearly challenging them other than the, the media, uh, they're able to get away with it. And I think uh, uh, part of the reputation is still standing. Uh, and I think your comment regarding some of the other issues that uh, really defined the NDP and uh, the other governments in the past in the 90s and now we're into 2021 where they've kind of moved in a bit of a different direction. Uh, those are issues that they've managed to skate by. Whether they continue to skate by those particular issues remain to be seen. But again, uh, unless they're in some type of opposing position of someone that can talk or challenge them uh, with some type of uh, credibility, I think they're going to carry on and get away with it. Uh, John, I uh, hope his health is around so he can stay around for a few more years. If not, uh, I'm sure the, uh, the people within the party, as Mike has mentioned, are chomping at the bit to take over as a leader of that party. 
And uh, I think they're probably uh, going to uh, change a few different uh, directions that they're going. And I think it'll be better for the constituents of BC. I might just unpack a, a little bit of what Cash has seen because I agree with the, many of his points there. Um, I, I'm going to come to the defense a little bit of Shirley Bond, who I think uh, was in a, in, a, in a tough situation, kind of thrown into the job, but uh, I think did really um, uh, increase the, uh, I think, the success uh, rate, if you'd like, in the question period uh, format. Uh, some of her media was not too bad. Uh, so it was kind of nice to see. I, it's very clear, Cash, and you, you probably saw this as well. This This party having been in government for, for so long, uh, really took a long time to find their feet um, in, in, in opposition and only towards the end started to be able to kind of hit the mark. Um, and as far as Falcon is concerned, I don't think it, uh, even Kevin Falcon has any illusions that um, uh, should he uh, be successful, and that's not even an entirely certain yet. We've, we're just coming to the end of the, the membership uh, deadline for the BC Liberals. And then, the, of course, just a few weeks from now, we'll see what the content looks like. Um, but um, whether it's him or, or Ellis Ross or somebody else, it's going to be a, a steep hill to climb uh, for that party. Um, and no guarantee, uh, because the NDP right now are looking strong. They've got a deep bench and uh, they've got the power of incumbency working in their advantage as well. Candy cane or lump of coal for Kennedy Stewart? Candy cane or a lump of coal for Doug McCallum? First, Mike. You know what? I'm I. I actually want if, if Bob, if you don't mind, I'd love for for Cash to get going on uh, on the, the mayors to start with because uh, uh, the last time we were together here on the Breaker News podcast, uh, Cash was uh, we had to hold him down. He was not, he was quite prepared to kind of let us know what he thought about that. Maybe Cash, I want to hear what you have to say because I uh, wouldn't mind rounding it out a little bit. What's happening here in Vancouver as well? Kenny Stewart, uh, I think, uh, is going to have uh, not a tough time getting uh, re-elected in this coming year. I think uh, the opposition that's in place to challenge him uh, will divide the vote considerably. I think uh, the, even with this tax increase, you know, close to 6%, I think it's not going to really deal with him. He's kind of mended the fences with the police department in Vancouver. They uh, seem to get the balance that they wanted. They didn't get the Cadillac version, but they did get a, a sound uh, budget uh, that'll move them forward. They'll be able to deal with some of the, uh, the issues there. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's uh, certainly going to be as controversial as what we have in Surrey right now. And I think uh, uh, Mr. McCallum has caused a, uh, a situation where, in fact, he better hope that some of the empathy vote and sympathy vote, which we're starting to see a bit of a shift based on some discussions I've had, are now starting to come his way. The problem as I see it, and uh, you know, I've been very uh, vocal in my comments, is there were so many issues happening in Surrey, but all we are hearing about is this one particular issue is the police service. Yes, it's a significant issue. Yes, it was one of his major platforms, but there's so much more in Surrey. And uh, Brenda has come out and she's trying to challenge him on these other issues, but it's not resonating in people's minds. The only thing they're seeing right now is this chaotic uh, argument regarding the transition to policing. I think the, the province has kind of stepped back a bit. I, I wish they would not. I wish they would move in and say, okay, I'm, we're gonna fix this once and for all and go with that Metro Regional uh, Police Service. But I think what's happening now is unless uh, Brenda and others that are seeking the mayor's position can come in and change the channel a little bit and start talking about so many issues that are affecting the second largest, soon to be the largest municipality in British Columbia and bringing them to the forefront for the next election. Uh, if we carry on with the anger that's being displayed uh, by both sides of this party, I think it's going to be a mess. And uh, you know, he's got a solid base uh, in Surrey. And uh, my discussions with some of that base in the last week or since the announcement of the charges is starting to motivate that particular base. Very interesting. Uh, uh, your comments about um, the the political resilience of, of Doug McCallum. I'm not entirely surprised at what you tell me. Uh, these, uh, first of all, were 
well, 10 and a half months away from an election. And uh, that's plenty of time in, 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 on the political calendar for McCallum to um, kind of rescue his reputation. Uh, this, uh, this issue of him getting charged is, an, uh, unfortunately, another embarrassing situation for one of our cities. We've seen uh, uh, local government leaders that have been in trouble in the past, but uh, Doug McCallum appears to be a lightning rod for some of them. And uh, you're right, it's it's going to require a, a really strong focus and organization for somebody like Brenda Locke to be able to, to kind of uh, take it over the line. Uh, she's a very capable and uh, and um, and I think well-regarded uh, person uh, in public life, but um, uh, you know the, the Surrey politics means you have to you have to. There's a lot of uh, constituencies within that large, uh, growing city uh, that you have to appeal to. Here in Vancouver, I, I don't really know what to make of what's going on, other than I feel uh, there's a tension that kind of goes um, a, a few different ways around Kennedy Stewart. I agree with Cash that he is um, right now sitting very comfortably in the possibility of re uh, re-election. I know there are a lot of people that I know and I talk to on a regular basis that would um, uh, dispute that. But right now we have a very split field, not a lot of uh, uh, people paying attention to the other candidates. And unfortunately, it just means all of them are going to, uh, to uh, eat into each other's success at the, at the polls next year. Stewart is a very unusual uh, 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 figure for the, the leader of Vancouver. He doesn't seem to have a real strong engagement with the city. He doesn't seem to be particularly passionate about anything. In fact, in an interview I read about him recently, he loved to talk about how low key he was. Well, that's all well and fine to kind of have a private life. But at the end of the day, you have to show that you really care about the city and it's very uh, important neighborhoods and communities and be a part of it. And, and, and Stuart now three years in office has shown none of that. I think both Vancouver and Surrey um, suffer from the same problem. They don't feel like things are going in the right track and they want to feel good about their cities again. And right now, um, we're, it's going to be, we're just going to have to uh, pick the best of a, a bad lot and incumbency will, will and, and a split field is what's going to get uh, a perhaps Stewart over the line. But again, 10 and a half months, a lot of things could happen in politics in Vancouver and in Surrey that could change the picture of what things look like next year. I just want to thank you very much for a great year of the Breaker.News podcast, part of yes. my usual diet of, uh, of listening every weekend. Uh, but it's been really, uh, really great to uh, kind of hear the show uh, carrying on into uh, hundreds of episodes now. Um, I'm just going to give a little plug for my own uh, uh, Vancouver Overcast. I'm going to be having uh, uh, our old friend Daniel Fontaine back on. Daniel has agreed to uh, reunite the City Caucus team. We're going to be doing our uh, download on all the top stories of local government uh, for 2021 in uh, the next episode, which you'll probably hear in a couple of weeks. That was Mike Klassen. Catch the Vancouver Overcast podcast. And Cash Heed, who was Deputy Police Chief in Vancouver and Police Chief in West Vancouver before he served as BC's Solicitor General. Now it's time on the Breaker.News podcast for Around the Rim. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Rim. In Taiwan news, China's dictatorship lectures Taiwan on democracy. Taiwan's foreign minister Joseph Wu incredulous over China lecturing Taiwan on democracy in referendums. China's Taiwan Affairs Office spokesman Ma Cha Guang criticized Taiwan's Democratic Progressive Party for sending representatives to U.S. President Joe Biden's Summit for Democracy. On the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Twitter page, Wu exclaimed, holy cow, we've got a PRC dictatorship lecturing Taiwan on how to be a real democracy and instructing us on what to do in referendums. He said he was at a loss for words at the audacity before calling on the Twitterverse to weigh in, and many happily obliged, such as democracy without elections, aka democracy with Chinese characteristics, and CCP, Chinese Comedy Party. In stuff.co.nz, New World apologizes after advertising soda syrup with no Chinese fruits. The reference to Chinese fruit was removed from the listings on Friday afternoon, but the descriptions had already been called out on social media. New World owner, Foodstuffs NZ, said the product description information had been provided by the supplier via an automated process. 
Soda Press Company Soda Boss Cameron Romerell said the statement had been added to some bottles in response to concerns over illness linked to fruit imported from China five years ago. The company had been hounded by retailers and consumers wanting to know if its products contained Chinese fruit, he said. In Hong Kong Free Press, protest graffiti students acquitted by Hong Kong court over unreliable police testimony. Chan Yu Hei, 21, and Wang Ho Lam, 22, were found not guilty of criminal damage. The magistrate ruled that the prosecution failed to present proof and said it made a very unfair case against the accused by asking the court to connect the students and the evidence found at the scene to suggest that they attempted to commit criminal damage. The pair were accused of damaging the walls and the ground of an underpass in Fo Tan Banyan Bridge on September 24, 2019, while Hong Kong was gripped by anti-extradition bill protests. That's Around the Rim on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. News podcast for Cascadia Calling. We look at news headlines around the Pacific Northwest. Welcome to the newest Patreon supporter of the Breaker.News and the Breaker.News podcast, the Independent Contractors and Businesses Association, which is hosting Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson on April 26th in Vancouver. For information and tickets to the annual ICBA Gala, go to icba.ca or call toll-free 1-800-663-2865. In the Oregonian, maggots, other insects, could become U.S. food staple as consumers seek out sustainability. The international investment bank Barclays is bullish on insect protein, noting that by 2050 the world is projected to need up to 70% more food for the ever-growing human population, and that, unlike beef, edible insects offer top-notch sustainability credentials. In the U.S., insect protein is already being used for animal feed. Right now, 30% of crop production in the country feeds livestock, not humans. It's also being used in some pet foods. In Como News, City Council's Kishama Sawant recall apparently defeated. There were 20,600 no votes, or 50.37%, to allow Sawant to keep her seat, and 20,300 yes votes, or 49.6%, to remove her from the seat. There were only 149 outstanding contested ballots, which were not enough to change the outcome. Earlier this year, a court ruled that Sawant broke city and state laws by misusing city resources. She used her key to let protesters into City Hall. She protested outside Mayor Jenny Durkin's house. The address is protected because Durkin is a former federal attorney. And Sawant also delegated hiring and firing her staff to socialist political groups. In the Merritt Herald... Trans Mountain details damage from storm. The pipeline restarted its flow at reduced capacity on December 12th after being shut off three weeks when rivers rose and mudslides tumbled down in BC between Merritt and Abbotsford. The majority of the 14 washouts occurred along a 30-kilometer stretch of the pipeline around the Coldwater River between Merritt and the Kokala Summit. Trans Mountain had as many as 570 workers repairing and assessing the damage on the pipeline. That's Cascadia calling on this edition of the Breaker.News podcast. The biggest sports superstar in Cascadia, Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson, is coming to Vancouver on April 26th. Get in the huddle at the Independent Contractors and Businesses Association Annual Banquet. For information and tickets, go to icba.ca or call toll-free 1-800-663-2865. Virtual Nanaimo Bar, brought to you by Spruce Hill Contracting. Every week we end the Breaker.News podcast on a tasty note by awarding the goodness of a virtual Nanaimo Bar to people making a difference. A virtual version of the province's favorite dessert bar goes this week to... Police, fire, and ambulance workers and dispatchers. Doctors and nurses and lab techs at hospitals. All the people who will be working for us on Christmas instead of being with their families. 2021 has been another hard year. Thank you for your service. 
You can nominate someone for a virtual Nanaimo bar. Send me an email to bob at thebreaker.news. Spruce Hill Contracting, Custom Homes and Renovations. Find more information at sprucehill.ca. Vaccine, 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 vaccine. Because once you're dead, then that's a bit too late. <laughs> I know I'm trying to be funny now, but I'm dead serious about the vaccine. I think we all want to get back to normal, whatever that is. And that would be a great shot in the arm, wouldn't it? That's it for the Breaker.News podcast for the week of December 19th, 2021. I'm Bob Mackin. Thanks for joining me. Did you know that on December 19th in 1984, Deng Xiaoping and Margaret Thatcher's Sino-British Agreement for the 1997 handover of Hong Kong, it was supposed to mean one country, two systems for 50 years, but human rights activists say the Chinese Communist Party broke its word in 2019. Now you know. Send me your feedback and send me your story ideas to bob at thebreaker.news. Bookmark thebreaker.news. You can also find us at thebreaker.ca. Sign up for the email newsletter and get updates to your inbox. For news as it happens, follow The Breaker News on Twitter and visit thebreaker.news on Facebook. You can support The Breaker for as little as $2 a month. For more information, go to patreon.com slash thebreakernews. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash thebreakernews. And Merry Christmas to every one of you who has contributed to thebreaker.news in 2021.